Steve, how are you, brother? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yes, I'm um, very, very well, mate. Thank you for asking. And you're in Iraq as we speak? Yeah, yeah. Currently uh, on lockdown in uh, Baghdad, Iraq, yeah. And uh, what, what, what has taken, take, what position are you uh, in there? Uh, I'm basically working for a, um, a um, private security company, um, part, part of the regional management team. Um, so, so we basically oversee all of the projects within our region um, and, and provide support to those projects. And if we go back to the beginning, get some yeah. light on my face. Um, you was it one para you were in? Yeah, yeah. So um, obviously, I left. I left school um, in year two thousand. Um, always wanted to join the military. Um, I had um, three three other family members um, in the parish regiment at the time. Um, so so obviously. You know, my, my allegiance was to the parachute regiment. Um, I was too young to um, join as an adult entry. So uh, my, my only option really was to uh, go to the Army Foundation College in Harrogate. So I went to the junior leaders um, college in Harrogate, uh, spent 12 months there, obviously set on the parachute regiment. Um, passed out of Harrogate, went to ITC Catholic. Steve, can you just explain for our friends at home what, because the junior leaders, I don't know if it still is, that used to be a, a big thing for school leavers, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's basically like a new concept that, that began, I think it was 1998. They wanted to kind of bring their concept of the junior leaders into the military. Um, so you basically conduct your education side to, I think, to get you to the rank of a sergeant. Um, and, and they kind of deem you as kind of, you know, the future of the senior NCOs of the military. Um, so, yeah, so, so obviously you go there, you conduct 12, uh, 12 months of training, which is a breakdown of education, military training. So it incorporates your phase one training as such. But you, um, once you get to your six month point, you, you then also choose your regiment, uh, which regiment you want to go to. Um, so obviously I, I was set from day one to go to the parachute regiment because my, my family allegiance. Um, so at the 12 month point, obviously you pass out and then obviously move on to your phase two training then, which uh, for me was, uh, ITC Catrick, uh, for, for Paradepa. And, um, yeah, it's, it's that thing, isn't it? The, the paras, oh, I don't know, may, maybe it's all, maybe it's all military units, but they just, they have got a rich history, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, it's obviously, there's a lot of rivalry, particularly with the Royal Marines. Um, you know, the, the, you know, everybody in the military, you know, obviously when, when, when you're in the military and obviously you're, you're kind of focused on your specific regiment, you know, you know, particularly parachute regiment, you know, we're like, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're the best at everything we do, you know. But when you, when you leave the military and you look back, you, you, you know, you understand that every, every regiment is the best at what they do in their specific role you know yeah. so you know and particularly moving into the corporate environment as well when i left the military um you know you, you work with a, a, a wide range of people you know people from all different backgrounds in the military you know some people from from, from different nationality uh, military as well you know australians and new zealand and americans you know so um yeah, so you know, you, you, you kind of get that greater understanding when you when you leave the military, I think, about all the specific roles that people do. Um, but obviously our role was was obviously a, you know an airborne light role, you know. So yeah. Steve, can you explain for us uh, how is the para set up? Because we hear like one para, two para, like nine, nine para and stuff. Can you just explain? what the different roles they do are yeah so, so so for example for the parachute regiment um particularly when i when i joined um you had one two and three para so so they're all they're all the same just obviously broken down into three different battalions um so one para when i joined obviously i went to the first battalion uh who were in dover at the time in kent and two and three para were in colchester where, where they still are now 
Um, so all, all the battalions were the same, just broken down because they can't put everybody into one battalion. Um, so, so yeah, so, so I was with one para for, um, for four years. Um, and then we, we basically re-rolled in 2006, um, into the special forces support group. So then we basically moved from Dover, uh, moved to MOD St. Athen near Cardiff. And, uh, our, our role then was basically to provide directing, uh, direct specialized infantry support to, uh, UK SF, um, was SAS, that- SF, yeah. Was that all of one para? Uh, the majority of one para, yeah. So, so it's basically a tri-service unit. So, they took the core majority of one para, um, and then obviously we had a company of uh, Royal Marines as well. Uh, they they joined us in a, a as like a commando company, and then we also had a platoon of RAF regiment um, who made up one of the one of the platoons in a in a rifle company as such. That sounds mental, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, you could never, yeah, you could never have envisaged it years ago, you know. But and, and what about then? I read Ant or I listened to Ant Middleton's book, and he talks about was it nine nine para? It, it's is yeah. it a, a support a support? Yeah, team? yeah, yeah. So 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 within sixteen hour assault brigade, because um, obviously you've got. You've got the logistics as well. Um, you know, 13 hour assault logistics. You've got um, within 16 hour assault brigade. You've got uh, nine nine squadron, which is um, obviously Royal Engineers. Uh, you've also got um, seven para as well. They they call themselves, which is uh, seven RHA, which is the Royal Horse Artillery. Um, yeah. So so obviously you know you've got your artillery detachments. You've got your engineer detachments. You know you've got your your 13 hour assault detachments as well. Um, that obviously make up the wider picture. Gurkhas? Yeah, 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 Gurkhas. Uh, there were Gurkhas attached to 3Para. Um, I'm not sure if they still are, but, but I know I know 3Para did have um, a number of Gurkhas attached to them. Have, have the Gurkhas got their own, would you call it a battalion? I'm not familiar with the... In the, in the Marines, it's, it, you're part of 3 Commando Brigade. Yeah, and then you have in my day it was three commando units, um, yeah. and I guess the Marines would be the equivalent of an army regiment. So yeah, 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 that's right. Um, what we what we find, but well, what I found with the with, with the Marines, for example, uh, when we moved to St. Athen, they're very self logistic. So you know they they kind of like you know that their guys, you know, could, uh, could do a wide range of roles. So, for example, when they come to St. Athen, you know, you, you have people who have been a chef for the last two years, people who have been a driver for the last two years, and they're very self-logistic, you know. Um, with the Gurkhas, obviously getting back to your question, um, they, they tend to integrate them into, like, a company within three para, I believe. Uh, we, we never had them in one para, um, you know, but I, I do believe that they, they did have them with three para. Mm. Wow. And so, um, yeah, all you guys rocking up for the uh, SFSG, the Special Forces Support Group. Yeah. It, it 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 reminds me of something. I can't think what, but it's it. The thing that's coming in my mind. You you've seen the film The Great Escape, right? Yes. Everyone's yeah. seen that. And suddenly, behind the wire, you've just got all these different people from different backgrounds, and they've all got to get on and their focus is is escape and i'm getting that sort of um yeah 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 there was there was obviously when when they first formed the unit obviously there was a kind of a bedding in period you know so um obviously when the marines arrived um you know they they, they kind of you know they kept themselves to themselves um initially but then as time went on they were obviously trying to integrate the unit um to kind of work together a lot more so for example um, I was actually in Afghanistan uh, for a six-month tour, um, providing radio communications um, to support F Company, who were the commando company at the time. Um, so I was like the only the only Parej bloke on the camp, you know. And then it was a company of Royal Marines, you know. But uh, you know, so so they were doing little things like that. There'd be parachute regiment mortars attached to F Company as well, you know. So they were trying to integrate it. Um, the the RF regiment guys, they obviously made up one of the platoons within a rifle company you know so so it's easier for them to integrate as such mm. 
but yeah, but everyone had their role. You know, we had JTAC, um, you know, which is RAF, obviously, forward air controllers. Um, you know, so, so yeah, so, so by the time I left in 2010, um, you know, the unit was established. It had been running for four years. years, years uh, um, company as well. And our rotations were basically um, mirrored on um, the SAS, Hereford. So it'd be like a two-year cycle. So you do your six months on counterterrorism, you do your six months on operations, you do your six months on standby, um, and then you will do your six months on you know courses and stuff like that. You know to to keep up to date with all your you know promotional courses and stuff. So it's like a two-year cycle. Was was everybody parroting? Was everybody parroting? Oh, sorry, we're getting some feedback yeah. there. Is it, yeah, is everybody paratrained? Yeah, yeah, everybody within the unit uh, had to either have completed um, the commando course or P Company. Um, but all the guys that came from the Royal Marines, um, they also had to complete their jumps course as well. Mm. Brilliant. And did you say, yeah. based in Wales, isn't it, the SFSG? Is, is that where, what you said St Athens? I've not, I've heard that name. Yeah, yeah, MOD St Athens. So, so it's... Um, yeah, it's about 30 minutes outside of Cardiff. Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah, just like an RAF station, basically. And how, what's the logistics like? I mean, do you sleep in Nissan huts or is it barracks? Is everybody mixed up or do you sleep in your, you know, do you have two-man rooms in your troop or how, how is that? No, because it's a, um, a, an RAF station, basically. Um, it, it's kind of split down into two kind of camps. So you've got kind of, East Camp that is where it's predominantly all the RAF, you know, they're, they're still doing their kind of RAF training as, um, as such. Um, on West Camp, which is where we were, um, all the rooms are single accommodation, you know, single man rooms. Mm. Um, you know, you have obviously, you know, your communal shower blocks and stuff like that. But, uh, but yeah, because it's an RAF station, they tend to be single man rooms, you know, which was a bonus for us because in Dover, it was like, you know, four man shared rooms. So Yeah. And those um, those blocks you're living in, uh, is it like a mix? Could you sort of have an RAF guy in this room, in this room next to you, and a Marine in that room there? Or no, you... no, no. So, so for example, um, one of the blocks would be, say, for example, F Company, who were the commando company at the time. Um, you know, so, so they'd have their own kind of block. Um, the RAF regiment guys. They would be in a block, obviously mixed with um, parachute regiment, because you've got three floors, so you got obviously three three platoons in a company. So, you know, they'd be like in the same block. Okay. And what what weapons were you issued with as standard in the SFSG? Yeah. So so we started off. So we had the normal um, SA80, A2, um, GPMG. You know, the mini meat machine gun. Um, but then we did progress uh, to C8s and M16 variants, um, you know, G3 as well. Um, you know, the, the radio communications equipment um, slowly kind of started to filter through because we were doing combined operations with you know, the SAS and SBS in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. You know, we had to be able, we had to have the capability to communicate with them. So, you know, we had to have you know all the interoperable communications um so the the normal radio communications that the green army have for example you know the regular army um you know we we, we were never issued that you know when bowman came out you know we were ne never issued that as a as a battalion uh we went straight on to um the cougar radios you know for northern ireland mm. you know keystone we were using those and then obviously moving on then to all the sf radio communications equipment Wow. Um, I'm just trying to, I want to get the SFSG covered in a one segment because then I, we can put that up as a separate clip, clip, Steve, and that'll, yeah, yeah. That, that'll get a massive amount of um, interest. So yeah, yeah. Can, can you give something without giving any operational um, stuff away? Cause we'll get in trouble. Can you give us yeah. any ideas? We'll just keep it anonymous, but but where they have worked alongside the SAS and SBS, and what kind of stuff that it involved. Yeah, so um, predominantly the the main two locations were Iraq and Afghanistan. 
So um, we, as a, as a unit, we deployed in 2005 um, in support of the SAS in, in, in Baghdad. Um, and uh, the, the, the main role there was basically to provide uh, fire support and cordon control um, to allow um, the SAS guys, you know, to go in and obviously, you know, you know do their job and, uh, and hit their targets. Um, in Afghanistan, there was a multiple range of operations. There were, there were three different operations in Afghanistan separate to the regular army operation, you know. So, so in Afghanistan, you had um, Op Herrick, which obviously the regular army were on. And then we had another three different operations as well, uh, which were SF operations, which we were working on, which range, you know, from um, Helmand, you know, basically uh, one of them was a training task. Um, for the um, Afghan task force, basically, which was the Afghanistan Spe uh, Special Forces. So part of our role on that was to deploy as a company group and um, split down at the location. So you would take half of the Afghan task force out on the ground. The other half would do training on the camp, and then you'd just keep swapping over. And, and it was an enduring operation, you know, for, you know, went on for a number of years. It was still going on when I left in 2010. You know, so it's like a training task. Um, then you had another couple of operations as well um, near Kandahar, um, working to uh, the SBS, uh, which was basically mainly our kind of support element, uh, like mortars and, and, and things like that to provide, obviously, mortar support and, and uh, you know, uh, and other support to, um, to the SBS. Mm -hmm. Can you give us, a, again, without giving any operational details away, but... I mean, top secret details is obviously what I mean. Um, yeah. Can you give us an idea, Steve? What's it like when the rounds start coming down? What did you have any particular ins? If you're anything like the other SFSG guys I've spoken to, they say, Chris, we had loads. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah, obviously, um, uh, Afghanistan. Obviously, that's that's uh, you know the the main place where obviously a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the activity was happening at the time for my time in SFSG anyway, um, you know, because we had, you know, the four separate operations in effect, you know, um, in, in Afghanistan. So, um, yeah, yeah, Afghanistan was interesting. Um, you know, um, one of my, in fact, my, my, my wife's cousin was actually uh, blown up in, in Afghanistan, um, which is how I met my wife. So, you know, um, obviously them being cousins. So, um, yeah, he, 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 he was blown up, um, you know, and we, we ranged from obviously Marja, Nadi Ali, you know, Helmand, uh, you know, we took part in the uh, rescue of a US journalist as well, uh, which we, we unfortunately lost a guy, um, you know, on that operation, you know, to are rescue. You, are you able to talk, talk, are you able to, to put us in your shoes, Steve, with that? I mean, What's it like when you're in, when you're in a forward observation base, or are you? No, in... So that operation basically, uh, I I wasn't on that particular operation at the time, but um, but basically, yeah, there was a obviously a New York Times journalist who was um, kidnapped. He had been kidnapped previously in Iraq as well, in, um, historically. So it was the second time he'd been kidnapped, um, and it was a joint operation with. Um, the SAS and, and our, our guys obviously to provide support. Uh, they went in with a couple of Chinook helicopters. When they when they landed, um, they landed into a hot DZ. So obviously, as soon as they landed, the rounds were coming in, and uh, we lost one of the guys, um, John Harrison. He, um, he he was one of the multiple commanders, and as he was coming off the back of the Chinook helicopter, he got he got shot in the head. And uh, but obviously to to keep the momentum of the attack going, obviously you know they've still got to do the job, you know, still got to complete the job and, uh, and achieve the objective. Um, you know, they, they rescued the New York Times journalist and um, I think the interpreter um, got killed in the crossfire as well. Um, but yeah, other, other than John Harrison, obviously, unfortunately being killed, um, you know, we, we didn't sustain any further casualties. Gosh, that sounds full on, doesn't it? Bloody hell. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's worth pointing out um, again, for our listeners, that when when you, when you've got to win the firefight, you've got to suppress the enemy. 
you take casualties, you just got to leave them there. That you, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That you know, you have to, you know, you have to keep that momentum going. You know, you have to, you know, have that aggression. You know, you have to attack with aggression, with momentum. You know, and uh, you know, and have that one thought in your mind, which is to achieve, achieve the objective. You know, that you've set out to do. You know, and then everything else, obviously, you know, you because it happened. Obviously, as they were landing and, and obviously coming off the back of the Chinook, you know, the uh, the air crew on the Chinook helicopter, you know, could then provide medical support, you know, for for the injured, you know, or, or John, um, you know. But unfortunately, you know, there was nothing that they could do. No. And um, any other, any contacts that you were involved in, Steve? Could you talk us through how how the round started coming down and what, what how did everybody react? Yeah, so so obviously, you know, when when we're out on the ground, um, as I said before, we our role was kind of like a like a training team as such, but we would mentor and coach the Afghan special forces. So we would kind of deploy as a group. Um, we'd we'd go out on the ground, we'd have a certain area to kind of operate in, and then we'd wait obviously to come under contact. Um, as soon as you come under contact, nine times out of ten, obviously, it'll be a small arms fire, um, RPG fire. Um, you know, and and we had to kind of strategically react to it. So, for example, our reaction would have to be at the same level as what the Afghan task force were, the, you know, the Afghan SF. So, for example, if um, if they weren't at that standard to advance, and then we would then do a fight and withdrawal, you know, and then extract from the location, and then as the operation was ongoing and, and they were becoming more proficient in their drills and skills, and then we could start advancing and then we could start taking out positions. Um, you know, they, they were called tiger teams as well, you know, which was, uh, which used to support the, um, the recce troops of, of different units as well, you know, on op Herrick. So a tiger team would be attached to say, for example, recce troop from three commando brigade. And then they'd go out and, uh, you know, and assist with them as well. Um, when I when I left in um, two two thousand and ten, they were they were a good standard because we'd been working with them for for about four years, and um, you know we we could lead them to a village, you know, sit off, sit on the high ground, provide overwatch and fire support while the ATF went into the village. They'd have a certain timing to be out by, and obviously if they weren't out by a certain timing, then we'd go in and obviously you know, see what was going on. But, uh, but yeah, re you know, the ATF were a really good standard, you know, and um, they had their own, they had their own rank structure, they had their own communications equipment. They provided the external perimeter security as well, not only for our camp, but also for when we're in, um, you know, LUPs and stuff like that. You know, that we'd, we'd provide the inner security, they would provide the outer security. So there was that element of trust you know, that you had to trust them, you know, to, you know, because you hear the horror stories, obviously, at checkpoints, you know, when, you know, they turn and, you know, open up on, you know, on friendly forces as such. Mm. But, um, but, yeah, you had to put a massive amount of trust into them. You know, and we built up, because it was such an ongoing operation, whereas, for example, the Green Army, they would have um, a six-month tour to kind of build up that rapport with the, um, you know, with the police, the Iraqi police or Afghanistan police. Whereas, because our operation was ongoing for years, it's just an enduring operation. We, you, you know, A Company had, had go through their rotation, and then a year and a half later, A Company would be back going through the same rotation again with the same guys. So, uh -huh. so you had that opportunity to build up the rapport, you know? Yeah. You know, so you could... Like, like con that. continuity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly that. You know, you could increase that trust. And, um, you know, and it worked well. It, you know, it did work well. What we did find... What was happening as well so we'd come under contact for example um you know so, so it'd be contact front um you know you react to the enemy fire um and, and what the taliban were doing because they knew exactly what we would do they knew that we would return fire we would speak to the jtac and we were calling for fast air to take out their position so so they, they obviously cottoned on to that so, so so they kind of amended their tactics so as soon as, soon as we had contact front we returned fire and then they would left and right flank us so that we were kind of like imagine a sandwich we were like the meat in the sandwich and the taliban with the bread either side so we were in the middle so as soon as we called in for fast air 
the fast air couldn't drop because obviously the risk of a blue on blue because we were in the middle of it. So then in effect, you've then got contact front and you've got a contact rear. Mm. So you've got two separate contacts, but the fast air can't drop because we're in the middle of it. That, that sounds incredibly, uh, I don't know if frightening is the right word, but you, 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 you're getting overrun and you can't yeah, call, yeah. and you can't call in air support so very shortly it's going to be fixed bayonets yeah and, yeah and it's every maybe even every man not every man for himself but you know it's going to be hand to hand combat yeah exactly you know and and a lot of the time you know because we were obviously we we're out on the ground for like a month at a time sometimes you know up to 4 weeks you know out on the ground um you know, then we'd go to different FOBs, you know, forward operating uh, bases, you know, to resupply and stuff like that, and to, you know, to conduct our admin, um, you know. But uh, but our our main kind of concept was literally return fire, call in fast air, a fast air will come in, obliterate them, and then we continue on task, you know. But obviously, the Taliban reacted to that and then obviously amended their tactics, you know, to facilitate, um, which then made it more difficult for us. So. Because you, you can't even, would you call it exfil when you get extracted? You can't call a chopper in because they're all, they're going to shoot the chopper down as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, um, I'll give a good example. Um, I touched on it earlier. My, my wife's cousin, obviously, he was, uh, he was seriously injured. He was blown up. Um, he had three operations um, in Afghanistan before he even got out back to the UK, to Sully Oak. Um, and you know the wagon the the uh monastery vehicle was basically cut in two because of the, the the force of the blast so you can imagine how big the blast was um so he obviously was um extracted however because there were troops in contact the the british military the british raf they they wouldn't they wouldn't come in to extract him so because of obviously the risk of a a helicopter being taken down. Mm. Um, luckily for him, there was um, a, an American call sign in, in the general area and they, and they heard it on the communications. So um, a Pedro call sign they were called, it was a Pedro, which was American Black Hawks. So the American Black Hawks actually came in to extract him out, you know, and if they didn't, he probably would have died, you know, with their blood loss. But, mm. um, but yeah, so, so it just shows you everybody has a role to play. And, did you get the call to fix bayonets? No, 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 I didn't. I didn't. The, 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 the only, probably the nearest time we came to that, to be honest, um, was in 2003 uh, during the uh, Iraq uh, invasion. You know, um, we had a situation, uh, there's a book out about it actually called The Last Round by Mark Nickel. And uh, we were in Al Kabir, Al Jamar in, um, in Alamara, Maysan province. What, and um, we, were you with this was fs S, S, F, S, G. you were with then in iraq as well yeah no this was uh, before we re-rolled so this was 2003 so this is what iraq. one para yeah one para yeah, yeah so yeah. so that was my first yeah that was my first operational tour so um so obviously you know i passed my training i went to one para and then literally a few months later that we then deployed to um kuwait and then subsequently onto Iraq and um and we you know the tour itself not much happened to be honest with you you know we were kind of you know it was more of a it was more of a war for armored infantry rather than a light role like ourselves um you know we did do a parachute jump um, in Kuwait to prove our capabilities to the Americans if required and we came very close to uh, conducting an operational parachute jump as well uh, but it got cancelled at the last hour basically you know, which we're all obviously disappointed. Yeah, we're disappointed, you know, you know, we're going to do like one of the first operational jumps for years. So, um, so yeah, so the tour was relatively quiet for, for our battalion. Um, however, uh, not long before we were coming back, there were RMPs, the Royal Military Police. They went to a police station and basically they got, um, they, they got surrounded by a mob. They got uh, executed as well. I remember it. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, in Al Kabir Al Jamal. They, lit so, they, they literally had to fight 
for their lives and they got overrun, didn't they? And they died. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, they were they were the RMP RMPs that were attached to kind of our unit as such. So they kind of went out. Um, we were scaling down as well. You know, we we're in a peace a peace role really, rather than a war fighting role at that point. And um, you know, they went out and visited the police station, and, and basically, um, yeah, just may, maybe maybe complacency set in, you know, because it's coming to the end of the tour. You know, all the ammunition had been descaled, handed back in. Um, I, I don't think they. Um, you know, conducted proper radio checks before they left. And, you know, there, there's a few things that went on. But, um, yeah, so it resulted in them basically being executed. Uh, but in the same town, at, at the same time, we had um, a couple of multiples on patrol from, from one para. And they, they obviously came under contact and then they extracted into a building and, uh, and then they got surrounded as well by, by a heavy mob. Uh, we, we, we requested that the household cavalry came in to, to try and, you know, get them out. But because of armoured piercing rounds, they couldn't do it. So our machine gun platoon uh, with the, uh, the Wimmick vehicles with a 50 cal, obviously that, that vehicle went in, you know, with the machine gun um, section and basically um, dealt with the situation. And then we managed to get our guys out, you know, and, you know, no one injured, no one killed. Um, yeah, but, but other than that, that was kind of... Um, you know, that was quite pro probably our most serious incident in, in Iraq during 2003, you know, for our battalion anyway. Mm, my God. Yeah, I, I, I say those guys, you guys must have been gutted because it's, um, was it the Second World War? Was it the last operational yeah. jump? And it would have been just a chance to, to have a real part of power history, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and we'd proven the capability as well, because in like I touched on in, in Q8, you know, we have to do a parachute jump in full MBC kit as well. You know, our MBC kit over our deserts, you know, which turned our deserts black for the rest of the rotation pretty much. Um, but yeah, so, so, you know, we did the jump to prove to the Americans. Um, so we were, you know, we were well placed to do it, but I think eventually, I think the government thought, you know, a Hercules with, up to 80 paratroopers, you know, it's too much of a risk, you know, and, and, and the likelihood of the, the Hercules possibly being, you know, shot down, you know, it'd be a massive loss. Mm, of course, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it got cancelled. And so, how, what year did you join up, Steve, and what year did you leave? Yeah, so um, I joined up in 2001. Um, I did my year in Harrogate. And uh, I passed out of uh, Catrick 2002. And then obviously, so from 2002 to 2006, um, obviously I was one para. And then from 2006 to 2010, obviously one para SFSG. And then I left obviously um, April 2010. And then since then, I've just been working in the commercial world, um, private security. How many jumps did you get in during all, all of that time in the military? Uh, I did eight jumps on my parachute training um, to, to, to get my wings. And then I did a further, I think it was a further 12 jumps in total. Yeah. Yeah, further 12. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing you joined after the, when they got rid of the balloon, right? And was it the sky van that yeah. they had? That's right, yeah. So, um, yeah, obviously, balloon was before my day. Um, but, yeah, they've got a sky van, so... Before you jump out of the Hercules on your parachute training course at Bryce Norton, um, they send you up in a sky van. So I, I, I think there's about four, four or five people can fit inside. Mm. And you basically, you're in this sky van. It's like a box with wings, basically. And uh, you just kind of step off and it's just like a sheer drop. You know, whereas in comparison to a Hercules, when you jump out of a Hercules, you kind of, obviously you're falling kind of diagonal, you know, because it's true. But with a uh, sky van, you just kind of just step off and just drop, you know. So, but yeah. And and just on, while we're on the subject of the, the the balloon jump, which is um, I'm lucky uh, lucky enough to have done two of them. Is, yeah. is has that become part of like para history now? Do people go, oh, back in, the, you know, is it something they look back at fondly and wish that they could all do? 
or is it just yeah. that's what the old guys did and we moved on? No, there's always been that obviously uh, stigma attached, you know, to, you know, like P Company, for example. P Company years ago, I believe, was obviously set out slightly different. They used to do basic whales and, and, and different kind of speed marches. And they've kind of altered the P Company to facilitate the modern era paratrooper. Um, you know, so so you get obviously the old and bold, you know, they're they're like, okay, P Company back then was a lot harder. You know, the P Company staff are like, no, it's still the same, you know, so uh, but yeah, like as for the balloon jump, you, you know, you'd like to do it to be able to say to the older generation, yeah, you know, we did that, you know. But uh, but times change, things move on, you know, and, and different concepts obviously come in. And I'm sure the next generation will be talking about the sky van. And saying, "Oh, I wish we could have done the sky back, you know, like the last generation." <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the whole parachute course. It's. I don't think you could ever put it into words for someone who hasn't hasn't done it. That there's, it it it's interesting as well because it's something that is associated with freedom which is like your skydiving yeah. and your parachute. You know, you throw Shav out of a plane, you're free, you're, you're yeah. flying, and well, a version of flying. But in the military, yeah. they blend that with real, a, a real um, military discipline isn't the word I'm looking for, but regimentation. So you're in the Herc and it's one, two, three, and it's all it's also military and then you come out and you shoot one and then the guy behind you two three it, it's all so it's like it i can't really put it into words it's just that feeling of being involved in in that is um, especially, especially with the sim sticks as well obviously when you're coming you know port and starboard you know when you're coming out of each door you know and uh, you know there's like half a second intervals you know so you know the pgis have to be on the ball because if they if they kind of dispatch you at the same time, you obviously meet at the back of the aircraft at the same time as well, which means then you could become entangled and then have air steals and stuff like that. Yeah, I've sp I spoke to somebody the other day that they came out together and they collided and their chutes wrapped up. I think they managed to get out of it. Um, yeah. It's quite amazing, isn't it? How by nature of the fact the air, the canopy's catching the air, it, it can pull you out of disasters. I mean, you can even yeah, yeah. La land on top of somebody else's chute if they've stolen your air. You land on their chute, you roll off, and then your chute just opens again, right? Yeah, so, so like on a, on a canopy, you can actually... Uh, well, I've known somebody, not me personally, but I've known somebody where they've, where they've obviously been coming down above somebody, and obviously the main risk then is an air steal. Because if you get an air steal, and then basically a parachute will come down like that and then that will steal the air of that one and then this one will come down and it'll just they'll just keep falling in intervals until one of them hits the ground you know so so obviously you know if you get in that situation you have to steer away immediately um you know i've known guys run across a canopy and it's like running across a floor because you know the air is filled it so it's like you know concrete so they kind of run across it and then try to steer away you know as quick as they can Yes, and to steer away for people listening is you're putting on one of your one of your four lift webs, isn't it? And it spills air out of one side of the canopy, and it yeah. it drives you away from your. I was going to say competition, then, but <laughs> comrade, yeah, exactly. I should, should should say competition to lift. Yeah, exactly. like, yeah, when you're early in the air as well for for a short amount of time, obviously, you know you're you know you've been dispatched, you've done your three second compulsory count, you know. You then obviously assess your drift, you know, you know, check below, make sure that no one's below you before you lower your equipment. Obviously, lower your equipment and then get your risers. And then before you know it, you're kind of, you know, you're reassessing your drift and then you're preparing for your landing, you know, so you're getting to your landing position and then, you know, prepare to do your, uh, you know, accept the landing, what's coming. And that ground rushes up fast, right? Yeah, yeah, we had a we had a few guys who, who, who you know struggled with ground rush. So, for example, as the ground's coming, they'd kind of reach out with their feet, but then obviously that that's how you break your legs, you know, because your legs are apart and you're kind of reaching down to touch the ground with your foot, 
Um, it's called Grand Rush. Um, you know, um, in my time, when, when I was on my jumps course, one, one thing I do remember was we watched a video before our first parachute jump, um, you know, just to get everybody kind of, you know, into the feel of it and stuff like that. And the video they showed us was um, about a Hupra, which is a hunger parachutist, which, you know, so, so I think they did it as a bit of a joke, you know, obviously the RAF, you know, trying to put the wind up us a little bit before our first jump. So, um, yeah, they showed us the video, um, you know, so we're watching it and, and you see this, this guy jump out and then obviously he's, he's, um, he, he's got caught and then he's hung up to the aircraft and then basically the aircraft is just pulling him along and he's just hanging on, on the side of the aircraft. And if he pulls his reserve parachute, because of the um, velocity and, and things like that, it split him in two. So it, it, a could al it could also bring the aircraft down, Steve, couldn't it? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so if you're in a situation where, 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 where you're in a hupra, um, you, you've just got to wait. You know, you've just got to, you know, the aircraft's flying and you've just got to just hang in there, wait until they can attach um, like an emergency parachute and then they cut you away. And then, but that emergency parachute is non-steerable. So, you know, so, so then you just obviously, you know, jettison your equipment, you know, get rid of your equipment and then obviously accept the landing, you know, that comes, you know, but I've, I've never, I've seen the video, but I don't know anybody during my time that experienced that, you know, fortunately. For anybody watching, if you go to, I think in both my videos I've done of the parachute course, um, I put that clip in there. Well, a clip of a Hupra guy getting hung up and it's, it, it probably must next to drowning. It's probably the most next frightening thing. And you actually see them clip the emergency parachute on and cut, cut this guy away. And um, yeah, <laughs> I'll pity that landing, but it, put it that way. Steve, you wouldn't, Sky... you wouldn't want to go back sorry, say again. I said you wouldn't want to go back up after that. I don't think. <laughs> no. <laughs> Imagine if it happened again. Um, the Skyvan, mate, is who flies that? What? Where's the pilot come from? Yeah, so, so it's the RAF. So um, Western on the Green. That's where that's where the drop zone is, uh, the DZ, but where we do all of our training jumps. Um, you know, so 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 it's like a RAF kind of aircraft um, RAF pilot and uh, yeah and they just take you on that short flight to Western on the green and then you you you, you do your jump you know and, and we, we only did one out of sky van and then literally as soon as you've done your one out of sky van you get on the coach you go back to Bryce Norton and then your next jumps out the hook you know which are which are totally different you know because like I say the sky van you jump and it is like a sheer drop so it simulates the balloon jumping effect mm -hmm. um, you know, for me personally, I prefer jumping out of the hook, you know, because it doesn't feel as like a such a sheer drop. Yeah, there's no fear jumping out. Well, certainly when you're in loose order, so you haven't got your big Bergen and, and, and your weapon or or a bit of they gave us a, a jerry can full of sand to simulate our Bergens. Right. But yeah, yeah, yeah it's almost like wickedly good fun jumping out the hook because you don't really have much. There isn't that cold, sort of cold chilling fear that when you stand in the balloon and you look over and you go, Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. It all happens so quickly. Yes. It, 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 it remind it, it, it's remarkable. It's got remarkable similarities to when they used to hang people in the prisons. And it's right, right, come here, now, bang. And before you know it, it's, that, that, yeah. that was like the parachute jump. It's like, right, number one to the door, okay, go! Arms across your reserve, go! It was also, it was also quick. Did you do an, you must have done an, a night jump. Yeah, yeah, so, so dur during your uh, parachute training course, um, you, you, you have to do one night jump. And then obviously on, on subsequent exercises in battalion, you, you, you know, you jump at night as well quite, quite a lot of the time. But I thought for me personally, I found my best landing was the night jump because you're more relaxed when you're coming in for your landing because you can't really see anything. So you're not kind of tensing up, getting ready for impact. You just kind of just 
keep your legs together and just wait for the impact. You know, um, so I so I found for me personally, my my best landings and most comfortable landings were the were the night jumps. Did you did you have any accidents or did you see anybody have any accidents, Steve? Uh, yeah, on on one uh, one particular exercise, actually, um, two thousand and four, um, we we did an exercise with uh, with two para, basically a joint exercise in Scotland at West through DZ. So um, obviously, we were weigh, weighing the equipment and stuff like that, and you know all of this equipment had to be had to be taken, you know, had to be on the ground basically, you know. So so we had communications equipment, we had mortar equipment we had you know all sorts of machine gun equipment so so the weight of our equipment was was crazy you know it like weighed more than our own body weight um so we were at sound cerny uh the raf pgis obviously they they weighed the kit and 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 for my particular container or my bergen they they said it was too heavy they said you can't you can't jump with this this is this is too heavy um however the equipment was important and it had to be on the ground so uh, the sergeant major at the time he, he basically said no it goes it has to go so they said okay no problem so it took two of us and another guy to carry it from the hangar to the aircraft because i, I can carry on my own so um obviously we got onto the aircraft um you, we're flying around obviously flying to scotland to uh, west through dz i think it was and um so we're on the aircraft and obviously, you know, we get told, you know, stand up, fit equipment. So we stood up, you know, connected the equipment. And uh, obviously because of the weight of the equipment, you know, I, I couldn't stand straight. I could only be kind of like leant forward as such. But the guy, the guy in front, because everybody was having the same kind of problem, they were kind of sitting back and they were sitting on the container, your container, as like a rest station. But when they're sitting on your container, that's pulling you forward even more, which is putting more strain on your back. So anyway, so I told the guy in front of me, I said, you know, can you get off the container? And, and he was like, yeah, yeah. And everything's chaos in there, you can imagine. Um, so, so, so I grabbed the container and I pulled it. I, I kind of straightened my back as much as I could. And then I felt something go in my back, which turned out to be a, a prolapse disc in my back. So... Um, yeah so so obviously i i kind of felt that shooting pain and it went down my back through my legs and i knew something was seriously wrong but i knew as well at the same time that equipment had to had to be on the ground you know so so, so I, I i kind of told myself i was like okay I've, I've got to go out the door because that equipment has to be on the ground to support this exercise um so then obviously you get action stations you know so you're moving forward so I, I'm starting to move forward with, you know, I can't remember the exact weight of the kit, but it was, you know, it was a horrendous amount. Mm. Um, so we're moving forward towards the door. I'm moving forward with this kit, with a prolapse disc. And, uh, you know, thinking to myself, you know, I'm not going to, my exit out of the aircraft isn't going to be a good exit. I'm just going to fall out the door, you know, just however I can. And as I was moving forward, uh, the, PG, uh, the PJI obviously noticed that there was something wrong. So he kind of used his initiative. Uh, he kind of came up, he quickly unhooked me and then obviously pulled me to the side and then everybody went round and then went out like, and then they flew me. Um, once everybody had exited the aircraft, they then um, flew me uh, from, uh, back to um, RF Lynham where they had a medical facility. So they flew me to RF Lynham. There was an ambulance waiting for me on the, um, on, on the pan. Uh, because they did a test on my knees they they basically got like a like a little hammer and then they hit you on your knee and then obviously your legs should react to it but when they were hitting my knee there was no reaction whatsoever so they they th you know they, they obviously thought right okay this you know this guy's in serious trouble so they put me straight in the ambulance they they decided not to take me to the medical center but they took me to the marlborough hospital in swindon directly so i'm so I'm in an ambulance now, going to the Marlborough Hospital, thinking to myself, I should be, I should have been out the door, I should have been on the DZ, and then obviously, you know, getting medevac from there. So I'm in the ambulance, I'm going to the Marlborough Hospital, I arrive at the hospital, I've got no feeling whatsoever in my legs. Um, 
you know, they, they tried the test again at the hospital. They hit my knees. Uh, there was no reaction whatsoever. And, and they were like, right, this is, you know, this is serious. You know, that, you know, it could be linked to, you know, paralysis, you know, you can be paralyzed. Mm. So, uh, they, they, they obviously sent me to a specialist. Um, then I had an MRI scan. Uh, my back obviously come back at the, you know, it, it, there was a serious problem. And, um, yeah, and then obviously I had to kind of recover from that, you know. But I made a full recovery um, afterwards, and then I, I went and did the uh, the army physical training course uh, to be a PTI after as well. So I managed to make a full recovery. Did you have the um, the uh, discectomy, the operation? No, no, no. They didn't do an operation in the end. I um, mean, it was a lot of physiotherapy. Um, they were reluctant to do the operation, so, so I basically had to go down to um, to a place in um, Portsmouth. Is it Hasler? Hasler in Portsmouth? Yeah, that sounds right. Hasler, yeah. I had to go down to Hasler, and then I had to have loads of physiotherapy, um, you know, on my back, and um, you know, and I couldn't I, I couldn't walk properly probably for about, about two months after. I had to kind of like you know I was just kind of shuffling around. You know, and even now, to be honest with you, I can I can put on a Bergen and I can go and do a go and do a ten mile, no issues whatsoever. But then I can be sat at home, and my wife could say to me, uh, "Can you just pass me the remote off the floor?" And then I'll pass the remote off the floor. My back a lock, you know. So so you know, I still get reoccurring issues, but you know, I've pretty much made a full recovery. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I've been through the same thing. I was it took me out for about two two years, just basically yeah. disa disabled. Could spent the first year or a lot of it in bed. Couldn't I couldn't move. I was in absolute agony. Um, yeah. Then I had then I had the first of four spinal procedures. Well, the final one was the the discectomy. <laughs> wouldn't I wouldn't wish that on anyone. That that whole process so painful so painful so how did you um when you left how long before you got involved in the security industry yeah so so when i when i signed off from the military um you have to obviously give a year's notice so my thoughts as soon as i signed off um i i, I knew what i was going to do you know i i, I knew the route i was going to take and uh, to be honest with you, I thought I'd probably only do it for a couple of years, you know, generate enough finances to, you know, to buy a house, buy, you know, buy a property, get on the property ladder. Because uh, my, obviously my, my wife, or she's my girlfriend at the time, but um, she was pregnant as well when I was, when I was getting out of the army, you know, so like my family were saying to me, you know, you know, are you crazy? You know, your, 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 your girlfriend's pregnant. Um, you've got no house and you're leaving a secure job. In the middle of a recession <laughs> you know and they said i think you're crazy and i was like no i said i know what i'm doing just leave, leave it to me and um yeah fortunately for me um obviously I, I left the military um i went to london had an interview um with a with a british company and um they offered me a job uh, straight away uh, in in basra in iraq as a medic so um basically team 2ic team medic um, yeah, so, so I went out there in 2010 and then um, I stayed with that company until December 2012 and then I crossed it to a, uh, a different company and I've remained with them ever since. So, so, so the, the company I'm working for now, I've been with them since the, uh, December 2012. Are your mates going to hate you that you just say cross decked? <laughs> <laughs> For yeah. people listening, that's uh, naval terminology. <laughs> it's a big no-no if you're a para. <laughs> um, yeah. So 2010, what was the situation in Iraq like then? Was, was, was there a big US presence and British presence still? Yeah, so, so there was quite a big US military presence, not so much of a British presence. Um, you know, the Brits are pretty much withdrawn to be honest um 2010 um the us was still operating on the basra cop the contingency uh, operating base um so you know you used to us and our vehicles our private security vehicles you know you'd always know when the americans are around because you're 
your commercial communication systems would go down because of the ECM. Uh, so the Americans would have ECM equipment and then you'd lose communications, you know, so you knew that when they were about. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, the, the Americans were still there. We, we had access to all the American kind of facilities as well on Basra Cobb. Um, you know, we could use like their gyms. They had, they had a PX, uh, you know, they, they had all sorts there. You know, they had, um, um, you know, Pizza Hut, you know, they had, <laughs> you know, Subway, they had a Subway there as well, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. And their PX is, is, is like a, the Harrods version of our naffy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like a souped up kind of naffy. Mm. And they, for some reason, they get mega discounted gear in there, don't they? So you can buy all your kind of like outdoor gear and Gucci kit. And it's, yeah, yeah. All, it's all tax tax free. Is that why it's so cheap? Yeah, yeah. We used to go in there, obviously, you know, if you want your Oakleys, if you want, you know, um, you know, new new kind of trousers, or you know, a decent pair of walking boots, or something like that. You know, or morels. You know, your morel shoes. Um, you know, you you just go straight to the PX. You know, and, and, and it's pretty much like duty free. When you were the uh, the med medic then, Steve, were you were you doing convoys, or were you sort of es escorting um, businessmen around? What what was your role? What was your team? Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah, so, so basically we, we were escorting um, clients around. It was an oil and gas project. Um, I, I, I've been quite fortunate. I've, I've, I've not been on kind of convoys. Um, all the projects I've been on have been oil and gas, um, you know, working for two different oil and gas companies. Um, so, yeah, so, so basically, you know, we pick up our clients in the morning, you know, we'd know the location we're going to. We're taking for meetings, taking maybe to like, like oil wells, water wells, you know, take them there, push out, get primitive security, let them do their job, put them back in the vehicle, and then obviously transport them back to, um, you know, back to Basra Cop, you know, to the accommodation area. Mm. And did you have no, any, um, did you have any hairy moments? My, one of my oldest, well, not oldest, but oldest friends, as in from the military, um, he was escorting a client to a, I think it was a, a gas station or some sort of power station in Mosul. And they mm. got, they got ambushed by something like, let's just say 17 pickup trucks appeared from the back streets, all um, obviously full of, full of armed men. And uh, it was just him and another Marine escorting this guy. So obviously they had no chance. Um, they're, they're, they pulled their vehicle across the road, so they cut all these pickup trucks off from their client, who then is, who was able to escape. But they were both obviously shot, shot, shot dead. And um, I think they then took their body. According to another one of my best friends, who went to receive this chap's body at the airport, it it mm. wasn't very nice what they'd done to him, you know. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, as for like kind of contacts and stuff like that, I, I've been I've been quite fortunate to be honest. Um, the main the main threat really I've kind of come into personally on a personal kind of um, opinion is IDF. I, IDF um, is it, basically indirect fire. So um, you know you, you'd have the insurgents. You know they'd want to they want to target a important facility. So for example, Basra Khan because they knew that the US were there, you know, the US forces. So they, they were prim primarily the main target, you know, the, the private security companies were not the target. Um, they were aiming more for the Americans. Um, so yeah, we'd have the IDF come in. One of, one of the rounds la landed in one of the, the accommodation areas where I was um, and my team, my two IC, and it took out a whole row of the accommodation block, which was um, a 107 rocket. Wow. Um, yeah, so, so we were really lucky, um, you know, to, to kind of escape that, to be honest. Um, but, but yeah, mainly, mainly IDF, you know, um, I've been quite fortunate. Uh, there, was a, there was an incident in Basra with the first company I worked for, uh, which impacted a different team, uh, but I was in the general area. So 
uh, the team were basically approaching a roundabout near a mosque in uh, Basra. And um, they, they, they set off an EFP, electrical um, uh, device. Mm. And uh, so, so basically a stronger bearing of an IED. So you have an IED and an EFP. The EFP is, is a lot more kind of powerful. And uh, it's designed, it was propped up to basically cut through the whole B6 vehicle. So it'll come in through the bottom and it'll exit through the top. And anything in that vehicle, it'll just cut through. So the, uh, the local national driver, he, um, he obviously died. He, his, his hand was found a few hundred metres down the road on the floor. Um, the, uh, the British expat, uh, he, he sustained quite serious injuries as well. Um, so, so, so yeah, but, uh, yeah, you know, you get, you get the odd incident like that. Um, one of the main threats as well is like an RTC, believe it or not, you know, because of the driving standards, um, you know, so, you know, if you, if you flash, you know, to, to, uh, to, to allow somebody to go, you know, they won't go. If they flash you to go, it means they're flashing to say, like, thank you. So you, you never know where you stand, you know on the roads with the driving. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, but as for contacts, you know, I've, me personally, you know, I've, I've been quite fortunate. Mm. Are you able to tell us a bit about what, what you're doing now, now, Steve? Yeah. So, so at the moment I'm, um, I, I'm basically part of a regional management team, um, working for an international company. And my, my role is basically to oversee, um, the, the number of projects we have in the region and basically provide um, the link. So I'm like the link man in a way between like the project managers and like the regional operations manager. So I'm like in the middle. So, you know, I try and assist them as much as I can, you know, and, and I, you know, I kind of add a bit more kind of bandwidth, you know, to, to the RMT as such. And what kind of clients have you got? Yeah, so, so because I'm in the RMT, we, we, we basically, obviously, because we oversee the projects, we have a kind of multitude of, of different clients, you know, different nationalities, you know, you know re ranging from, you know, uh, Russians to Americans, you know, to Europeans, you know, Australians, you know, a wide range of international kind of different clients, you know, we, we kind of look after. And how's the security situation there now? How's how's the peace? Have, have they have they retained any level of you know? Is, I don't know if normality is the right word. Yeah. So um, obviously, the start of the year, uh, we had the incident in Baghdad with uh, Soleimani, who who was the Iranian general. Uh, ah. He was. Yeah. So he was he was taken out basically on the. Uh, on the road leading up to and leading out of um, Baghdad International Airport, uh, the Bayab. So that obviously increased tensions. And then the, uh, the prime minister as well um, changed as well. You know, the government kind of uh, changed. And then what we experienced as well is it, it, basically quite a few protests. So particularly during COVID, you know, the coronavirus as well at the moment, because obviously we have curfew, we have lockdown, um, you know, it's impacting on obviously the, the, the local communities, um, you know, so, so you do find that you do get a lot of protests, um, you know, but, um, but, but, but yeah, because of COVID, it's kind of more geared towards that at the moment and, and the protests instead of kind of, you know, terrorism. And this Soleimani thing, I've heard some interesting stuff there. He was, an Iranian general, right? Something like this. He yeah. was he was blown up leaving the airport, was it in in Baghdad? Yeah, yes. In a, he in was a, departing by in a drone strike by the Americans. I yeah, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. I believe so. No, I heard a the, the the official story which a think we're all old enough now to know is never really the true story but the official story was like he was really anti-american and and this guy you know he's planning to take american lives he's got to go 
the, yeah. the, the the story that was that was doing the rounds though was that he was anti some oil deal between mm -hmm. the Americans and Iran. Um, he was like, you know, no, we're not doing business with the Americans, and so I'm just for our friends at home showing you there's always there's always two sides to um well not even two sides but there's always alternate ulterior reasons behind military strikes and uh yeah interesting yeah. so steve i'm gonna thank you ever so much mate for joining us and sharing okay. your story it's no problem, lovely too. lovely to talk to uh one of my brothers in the paras yeah <laughs> um, it was brilliant throwing myself out of aeroplanes with you guys. I, I, one of the, just really lucky I've done some, like yourself, I've just had that, that opportunity to do some great, great things in, in this life. So yeah. keep in touch, mate. Let us know how it all goes. Um, there'll probably be a load of questions for you on, um, on YouTube, when this premieres, there'll be a live chat. If you if you're not on duty or whatever, and you can come and answer a few of the guys and girls' questions, I think they'd um, they'd yeah. appreciate that. But don't feel <laughs> I don't know what the, I don't know what the time difference is. So uh, yeah, it might, we're, 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 we're two hours ahead um, of the UK over here. Oh, that's not too bad. Well, it'll be about ten o'clock your time then, so that's not too too horrendous. Um, yeah. So thank you, thank you ever so much again, Steve. And to our yep. friends at home, massive respect to all of you. Thank you for watching another edition of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. And if you could like and subscribe, that's going to help. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines commando, and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.